Welcome to the Mick Dark Horror Series. Lights out. Good. Here we go. Part 1 In an upper room of an unoccupied dwelling in the part of San Francisco, known as North Beach, lay the body of a man under a sheet. The hour was near nine in the evening. The room was dimly lighted by a single candle. Although the weather was warm, the two windows, contrary to the custom which gives the dead plenty of air, were closed and the blinds drawn down. The furniture of the room consisted of but three pieces, an armchair, a small reading stand supporting the candle, and a long kitchen table, supporting the body of the man. All these, as also the corpse, seemed to have been recently brought in for an observer, had there been one, would have seen that all were free from dust, whereas everything else in the room was pretty thickly coated with it and there were cobwebs in the angles of the walls. Under the sheet, the outlines of the body could be traced, even the features, these having that unnaturally sharp definition which seems to belong to faces of the dead, but is really characteristic of those only that have been wasted by disease. From the silence of the room, one would rightly have inferred that it was not in front of the house, facing a street. It really faced nothing but a high breast of rock, the rear of the building being set into a hill. As a neighboring church clock was striking nine with an indolence which seemed to imply such an indifference to the fight of time that one could hardly help wondering why it took the trouble to strike at all. The single door of the room was opened and a man entered, advancing toward the body. As he did so, the door closed, apparently of its own volition. There was a grating, as of a key turned with difficulty, and the snap of a lock bolt as it shot into its socket. A sound of retiring footsteps in the passage outside ensued, and the man was to all appearance a prisoner. Advancing to the table, he stood a moment looking down at the body, then with a slight shrug of the shoulders, walked over to one of the windows and hoisted the blind. The darkness outside was absolute, the panes were covered with dust. But by wiping this away, he could see that the window was fortified with strong iron bars crossing it within a few inches of the glass and embedded in the masonry on each side. He examined the other window. It was the same. He manifested no greater curiosity in the matter, did not even so much as raise the sash. If he was a prisoner, he was apparently a tractable one. Having completed his examination of the room, he seated himself in the armchair, took a book from his pocket, drew the stand with its candle alongside, and began to read. The man was young, not more than thirty, dark in complexion, smooth-shaven with brown hair. His face was thin and high-nosed, with a broad forehead and a firmness of the chin and jaw, which is said by those having it to denote resolution. The eyes were gray and steadfast, not moving except with definitive purpose. They were now, for the greater part of the time, fixed upon his book. But he occasionally withdrew them and turned them to the body on the table, not apparently from any dismal fascination, which under such circumstances it might be supposed to exercise upon even a courageous person, nor with a conscious rebellion against the contrary influence which might dominate a timid one. He looked at it as if in his reading he had come upon something recalling him to a sense of his surroundings. Clearly this watcher, by the dead, was discharging his trust with intelligence and composure, as became him. After reading for perhaps a half hour, he seemed to come to the end of a chapter and quietly laid away the book. He then rose, and taking the reading stand from the floor, carried it, into a corner of the room near one of the windows, lifted the candle from it, and returned to the empty fireplace before which he had been sitting. A moment later he walked over to the body on the table, lifted the sheet, 
and turned it back from the head, exposing a mass of dark hair and a thin face cloth, beneath which the features showed with even sharper definition than before. Shading his eyes by interposing his free hand between them and the candle, he stood looking at his motionless companion with a serious and tranquil regard. Satisfied with his inspection, he pulled the sheet over the face again, and returning to the chair, took some matches off the candlestick, put them in the side pocket of his sack coat, and sat down. He then lifted the candle from its socket and looked at it critically, as if calculating how long it would last. It was barely two inches long. In another hour, he would be in darkness. He replaced it in the candlestick and blew it out. <sighs> Part 2 In a physician's office in Kearney Street, three men sat about a table, drinking punch and smoking. It was late in the evening, almost midnight indeed, and there had been no lack of punch. The gravest of the three... Dr. Helberson was the host. It was in his rooms they sat. He was about 30 years of age. The others were even younger. All were physicians. The superstitious awe with which the living regard the dead, said Dr. Helberson, is hereditary and incurable. One needs no more be ashamed of it than the fact that he inherits, for example, an incapacity for mathematics or a tendency to lie. The others laughed. Oughtn't a man be ashamed to lie? Asked the youngest of the three, who was in fact a medical student not yet graduated. My dear Harper, I said nothing about that. The tendency to lie is one thing. Lying is another. But do you think, said the third man, that this superstitious feeling, this, this fear of the dead, reasonless as we know it to be, is universal? I am myself not conscious of it. Oh, but it is in your system for all that, replied Helberson. It needs only the right conditions, what Shakespeare calls the Confederate season, to manifest itself in some very disagreeable way that will open your eyes. Physicians and soldiers are, of course, more nearly free from it than others. Physicians and soldiers? Why don't you add hangmen and headsmen? Let us have in all the assassin classes. No, my dear man, sure. The juries will not let the public executioners acquire sufficient familiarity with death to be altogether unmoved by it. Young Harper, who had been helping himself to a fresh cigar at the sideboard, resumed his seat. What would you consider conditions under which any man or woman born would become insupportably conscious of his share of our common weakness in this regard? He asked rather verbosely. Well, I should say that if a man were locked up all night with a corpse, alone, in a dark room of a vacant house, with no bed covers to pull over his head, and lived through it without going altogether mad, he might justly boast himself not of woman born, nor yet, like Macduff, a product of Caesarean section. I thought you would never finish piling up conditions, said Harper. But I know a man who is neither a physician nor a soldier, who will accept them all, for any stake you like to name. Who is he? His name is Jurette, a stranger here. He comes from my town in New York. I have no money to back him, but he will back himself with loads of it. How do you know that? He'd rather bet than eat. As for fear, I dare say he thinks it's some cutaneous disorder, or possibly a particular kind of religious heresy. What does he look like? Halberson was evidently becoming interested. Like Mancher here. Might be his twin brother. I accept the challenge, said Halberson promptly. Awfully obliged to you for the compliment, I'm sure, drawled Mancher, who was growing sleepy. Hey, can I get into this? Not against me, Halberson said. I don't want your money. All right, said Mancher. I'll be the corpse. <laughs> the outcome of this crazy conversation we have seen. Part 3 In extinguishing his meager allowance of candle, Mr. Jarrett's object was to preserve it against some unforeseen need. 
He may have thought, too, or half thought, that the darkness would be no worse at one time than another, and if the situation became insupportable, it would be better to have means of relief, or even release. At any rate, it was wise to have a little reserve of light, even if only to enable him to look at his watch. No sooner had he blown out the candle and set it on the floor at his side, than he settled himself comfortably in the armchair, leaned back and closed his eyes, hoping and expecting to sleep. In this, he was disappointed. He had never in his life felt less sleepy, and in a few minutes he gave up the attempt. But what could he do? He could not go groping about in absolute darkness, at the risk of bruising himself, at the risk, too, of blundering against the table and rudely disturbing the dead. We all recognize their right to lie at rest, with immunity from all that is harsh and violent. Jurette almost succeeded in making himself believe that considerations of this kind restrained him from risking the collision and fixed him to the chair. While thinking of this matter, he fancied that he heard a faint sound in the direction of the table. What kind of sound he could hardly have explained. He did not turn his head. Why should he? In the darkness? But he listened. Why should he not? And listening, he grew giddy and grasped the arms of the chair for support. There was a strange ringing in his ears. His head seemed bursting. His chest was oppressed by the constriction of his clothing. He wondered why it was so, and whether these were symptoms of fear. Then, with a long and strong expiration, his chest appeared to collapse and with the great gasp with which he refilled his exhausted lungs, the vertigo left him, and he knew that so intently had he listened that he had held his breath almost to suffocation. The revelation was vexatious. He arose, pushed away the chair with his foot, and strode to the center of the room. But one does not stride far in darkness. He began to grope, and finding the wall, followed it to an angle, turned, followed it past two windows, and there, in another corner, came into violent contact with the reading stand, overturning it. It made a clatter that startled him. He was annoyed. Ah! How the devil could I have forgotten where it was? He muttered, and groped his way along the third wall to the fireplace. I must put things to rights, said he, feeling the floor for the candle. Having recovered that, he lighted it, and instantly turned his eyes to the table, where, naturally, nothing had undergone any change. The reading stand lay unobserved upon the floor. He had forgotten to put it to rights. He looked all about the room, dispersing the deeper shadows by movements of the candle in his hand, and crossing over to the door, tested it by turning and pulling the knob with all his strength. It did not yield, and this seemed to afford him a certain satisfaction. Indeed, he secured it more firmly by a bolt, which he had not before observed. Returning to his chair, he looked at his watch. It was half past nine. With a start of surprise, he held the watch at his ear. It had not stopped. The candle was now visibly shorter. He again extinguished it, placing it on the floor at his side as before. Mr. Jarrett was not at his ease. He was distinctly dissatisfied with his surroundings and with himself for being so. What have I to fear, he thought. This is ridiculous and disgraceful. I will not be so great a fool, but courage does not come of saying. I will be courageous, nor recognizing its appropriateness to the occasion. The more Jarrett condemned himself, the more reason he gave himself for condemnation, the greater the number of variations which he played upon the simple theme of the harmlessness of the dead, the more insupportable grew the discord of his emotions. What? He cried aloud in the anguish of his spirit. What shall I, who have not a shade of superstitious in my nature, I who have no belief in immortality, I who now, and never more clearly than now, that the afterlife is the dream of a desire, shall I lose at once my bet, my honor, my self-respect, perhaps my reason? Because certain savage ancestors dwelling in caves and burrows can see the monstrous notion that the dead walk by night. That. Distinctly, unmistakably, 
Mr. Jarrett heard behind him a light, soft sound of footfalls, deliberate, regular, successively nearer. Part 4 Just before daybreak the next morning, Dr. Helberson and his young friend Harper were driving slowly through the streets of North Beach in the doctor's coupe. Have you still the confidence of youth and the courage or stolidity of your friend? Said the elder man. Do you believe that I've lost this wager? I know you have, replied the other with enfeebling emphasis. Well, upon my soul, I hope so. It was spoken earnestly, almost solemnly. There was silence for a few moments. Harper, the doctor resumed, looking very serious in the shifting half-lights that entered the carriage as they passed the street lamps. I don't feel altogether comfortable about this business. If your friend had not irritated me by the contemptuous manner in which he treated my doubt of his endurance, a purely physical quality, and by the cool incivility of his suggestion that the corpse be that of a physician, I should not have gone on with it. If anything should happen, we are ruined, as I fear we deserve to be. What can happen? Even if the matter should be taking a serious turn, of which I am not at all afraid, Mancha has only to resurrect himself and explain matters. With a genuine subject from the dissecting room or one of your late patients, it might be different. Dr. Mancher then had been as good as his promise. He was the corpse. Dr. Helberson was silent for a long time, as the carriage, at a snail's pace, crept along the same street it had traveled two or three times already. Presently, he spoke. Well, let us hope that Mancher, if he has had to rise from the dead, has been discreet about it. A mistake in that might make matters worse instead of better. Yes, <laughs> said Harper. Jarrett would kill him. But, Doctor... Looking at his watch as the carriage passed the gas lamp. It is nearly four o'clock at last. A moment later, the two had quitted the vehicle and were walking briskly towards the long, unoccupied house belonging to the doctor in which they had immured Dr. Jarrett in accordance with the terms of the mad wager. As they neared it, they met a man running. Can you tell me... He cried, suddenly checking his speed. Where can find a doctor? What's the matter? Helberson asked non-committal. Go, go and see for yourself, said the man, resuming his running. They hastened on, arrived at the house. They saw several persons entering in haste and excitement in some of the dwellings nearby, and across the way, the chamber windows were thrown up, showing a protrusion of heads. All heads were asking questions none heeding the questions of the others. A few of the windows with closed blinds were illuminated. The inmates of those rooms were dressing to come down, exactly opposite the door of the house that they sought a street lamp through a yellow, insufficient light upon the scene, seeming to say that it could disclose a good deal more if it wished. Harper paused at the door and laid a hand upon his companion's arm. "'It's all up with us, Doctor,' he said in extreme agitation." which contrasted strangely with his free and easy words. The game has gone against us all. Let's not go in there. I'm for lying low. I'm a physician, said Dr. Helberson calmly. There may be need of one. They mounted the doorsteps and were about to enter. The door was open. The street lamp opposite lighted the passage into which it opened. It was full of men. Some had ascended the stairs at the farther end and denied admittance above, waited for better fortune. All were talking, none listening. Suddenly, on the upper landing there was a great commotion. A man had sprung out of a door and was breaking away from those endeavoring to detain him. Down through the mass of affrighted idlers he came, pushing them aside, flattening them against the wall on one side, or compelling them to cling to the rail on the other, clutching them by the throat striking them savagely, thrusting them back down the stairs and walking over the fallen. His clothes was in disorder. He was without a hat. His eyes, wild and restless, had in them something more terrifying that is apparently superhuman strength. 
His face, smooth-shaven, was bloodless, his hair frost-white. As the crowd at the foot of the stairs, having more freedom, fell away to let him pass, Harper sprang forward. Jarrett! Jarrett! He cried. Dr. Halberson seized Harper by the collar and dragged him back. The man looked into their faces without seeming to see them and sprang through the door, down the steps, into the street, and away. A stout policeman who had had inferior success in conquering his way down the stairway followed a moment later and started in pursuit. All the heads in the windows, those of women and children now, screaming in guidance. The stairway being now partly cleared, most of the crowd having rushed down to the street to observe the flight and pursuit. Dr. Helberson mounted to the landing, followed by Harper. At a door in the upper passage, an officer denied them admittance. We are physicians, said the doctor, and they passed in. The room was full of men, dimly seen, crowded about a table. The newcomers edged their way forward, looked over the shoulders of those in the front rank. Upon the table, the lower limbs covered with a sheet, lay the body of a man, brilliantly illuminated by the beam of a bullseye lantern held by a policeman, standing at the feet. The others, excepting those near the head, the officer himself, were all in darkness. The face of the body showed yellow, repulsive, horrible. The eyes were partly open and upturned, and the jaw fallen. Traces of froth defiled the lips, the chin, the cheeks. A tall man, evidently a doctor, bent over the body with his hand thrust under the shirt front. He withdrew it and placed his two fingers in the open mouth. This man has been about six hours dead, said he. It is a case for the coroner. He drew a card from his pocket, handed it to the officer, and made his way toward the door. Clear the room! Out all! said the officer, sharply, and the body disappeared as if it had been snatched away. As shifting the lantern, he flashed its beam of light here and there against the faces of the crowd. The effect was amazing. The men, blinded, confused, almost terrified, made a tumultuous rush for the door, pushing, crowding, and tumbling over one another as they fled, like the hosts of night before the shafts of Apollo. Upon the struggling, trampling mass, the officer poured his light without pity and without cessation. Caught in the current, Halberson and Harper were swept out of the room and cascaded down the stairs into the street. Good God, doctor! Did I not tell you that Dredd would kill him? said Harper, as soon as they were clear of the crowd. I believe you did replied the other, without apparent emotion. They walked on in silence, block after block. Against the graying east, the dwellings of the hill tribes showed in silhouette. The familiar milk wagon was already astir in the streets. The baker's man would soon come upon the scene. The newspaper carrier was abroad in the land. It strikes me, youngster, said Halberson, that you and I have been having too much of the morning air lately. It is unwholesome. We need a change. What do you say to a tour in Europe? When? I'm not particular. I should suppose that four o'clock this afternoon would be early enough. I'll meet you at the boat, said Harper. Seven years afterward, these two men sat upon a bench in Madison Square, New York, in familiar conversation. Another man, who had been observing them for some time, himself unobserved, approached and courteously lifting his hat from locks as white as frost, said, I beg your pardon, gentlemen, but when you have killed a man by coming to life, it is best to change clothes with him, and at the first opportunity, make a break for liberty. Helberson and Harper exchanged significant glances. They were obviously amused. The former then looked the stranger kindly in the eye, and replied, That's always been my plan. I entirely agree with you, to its advent. He stopped suddenly, rose, and went white. He stared at the man, open-mouthed. He trembled visibly. Ah, said the stranger. I see that you are indisposed, doctor. If you cannot treat yourself, Dr. Harper can do something for you, I'm sure. Who the devil are you? Said Harper bluntly. The stranger came nearer and bending towards them, said in a whisper, 
I call myself Jared sometimes, but I don't mind telling you, for old friendship, that I am Dr. William Mancha. The revelation brought Harper to his feet. Mancha? He cried, and Halberson added, It's true, by God! Yes, said the stranger, smiling vaguely. It is true enough, no doubt. He hesitated and seemed to be trying to recall something, then began humming a popular air. He had apparently forgotten their presence. Look here, Mancher, said the elder of the two. Tell us just what occurred that night to Jarrett, you know. Oh yes, about Jarrett, said the other. It's odd. I should have neglected to tell you. I tell it so often. You see, I knew, by overhearing him talking to himself, that he was pretty badly frightened. So I couldn't resist the temptation to come to life, have a bit of fun at him. I couldn't really. That was all right, though certainly I did not think he would take it so seriously. I did not, truly. And afterward, well, it was a tough job changing places with him, and then, damn you! You didn't let me out! Nothing could exceed the ferocity with which these last words were delivered. Both men stepped back in alarm. We, we, why, why? Halberson stammered, losing his self-possession utterly. We had nothing to do with it. Didn't I say you were doctors Hellborn and Sharper? <laughs> Inquired the man, laughing. My name is Halberson, yes, and this gentleman is Mr. Harper, replied the former, reassured by the laugh. But we are not physicians now. We are, well, hang it, old man, we are gamblers. And that was the truth. A very good profession, very good indeed. And by the way, I hope Sharper here paid over Jarrett's money like an honest stakeholder. A very good and honorable profession, he repeated, thoughtfully, moving carelessly away. But I stick to the old one. I am High Supreme Medical Officer of the Bloomingdale Asylum. It is my duty to cure the superintendent.